Hi, and welcome to Hall in the States. I'm Paul Triel. And I'm Rebecca Rose. And you're listening to episode number 552. How are you today? Good, how are you? Very good, thanks. Uh, we thought we'd spend a bit of time today talking about a recent decision out of the Ontario Superior Court of Justice, a decision of Justice Dunphy. The name of the case is Eisman and Kuntz. The site is 2018 ONSC 3650, and it deals with uh, wills, revocation of wills, handwritten alterations mm -hmm. to wills, um, deleting bequests, changing bequests, yeah. <laughs> and excluding parties, and the effect of the Succession yeah. Reform Act on intestacy. Covers a lot of ground, so yeah. we thought it was an interesting case to mm -hmm. uh, to mention. Garrett Herrick uh, uh, did a vlog on this, and mm -hmm. we thought we'd expand a bit on that. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can talk a bit about the case then. It's an interesting case involving a policeman who passed away, um, died leaving a number of wills. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can spend yeah. a bit of time going through the, the estate planning that he did. So he had, um, yeah, like you said, a, a few different wills. Um, his first will was made, uh, he lived in Germany when all of, all of his estate planning began. Um, so his first will was made when he lived in Germany back in 1967, and that was a formal will. Right, and that seems to be the only will where a, a lawyer or notary was involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Rest of it, with himself. So that was a formal will that he made. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then his second will was after he had moved to Canada. Um, just to, to talk about the first will. So the first mm -hmm. will was a simple will. Um, mm -hmm. It divided his his estate between his wife, to yeah. whom he was wearing at the time, yeah. and his daughter, Petra. Yeah, and he only had the one the one child, uh, that, that daughter. Um, and then the second will was made after he was divorced. Right. So, so he was divorced. So he made the first will to his wife and daughter, mm -hmm. and then divorced, made a second will when he was living in Canada. Yeah. This was a handwritten will that he yeah. made himself, yeah. and it left everything to his daughter. Yeah, that's right. Um, so then he made a third will, which was also in his own handwriting, not a formal will. Um, and this one was a little bit different. Uh, he had a couple of specific requests to various family members. Mm -hmm. And then he said that the residue of his estate was to go to his daughter again. And then there was some other statement that he made in the will, but it was illegible. So right, I think that's something to do with. It. I think at that point he was estranged from his daughter, but he yeah. definitely still provided for her. Yeah, their relationship they I think were estranged, and then they reunited, and then they were estranged again. So it kind of went back and forth over right. the years. Um, so that was his third will, and then the third will there was. Um, that's where some of the kind of more interesting stuff starts to happen. There were some handwritten notes on the third will, um, specifically with respect to the specific bequests that he had made to the family members, and he it seemed as though he wanted to increase the amount of the gifts. Right, and from the decision, it seems that he crossed out those uh, the, the dollar values of those mm -hmm. bequests, crossed it out with a different colored pen, mm -hmm. and wrote in a higher amount yeah. for each of them. Yeah, so but those weren't initialed or the Sign. Yeah, exactly. They just just the notes on their own. Um, and then there was a fourth um, testamentary document, we'll call it. Uh, it was made uh, in 2009. This is the last testamentary document document that was found again in the testator's own handwriting. And it said um, that his daughter may not receive a single euro out of his estate. So he, his intent there seems to be to, to cut out his daughter. Completely. Yeah, yeah. Because the difficulty with that is it didn't say what would happen to the residue of the estate. Exactly. And um, the, the court in this case actually found that that fourth testamentary, doc testamentary document was a codicil to the earlier will. Um, and then it revoked that gift of residue to his daughter. Right. Right. So I think the court went through and found that the first will, the material will, was mm -hmm. revoked by a subsequent will. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so the subsequent will was the one that gave everything to the daughter. Yeah. That was um, validly changed by the next document that yep. made specific requests to the, uh, the relatives. Yeah. Um, the court considered what the effect was of crossing out the numbers and putting in new numbers mm -hmm. and found that those were, were, were invalid because they weren't yeah. in compliance with the Succession Law Reform Act as yeah. valid alterations. Yeah, and I also thought it was interesting how the court thought about whether they would invalidate the gifts altogether. Right. Um, but ultimately they, they didn't because the Successional Reform Act has to be rendered not apparent at all. And in this case, you could still read what was underneath it. Right, so those bequests to the family members specific bequests were still valid mm -hmm. at the lower amount, not yeah. the changed higher amount yeah. because the changes were properly done. Mm -hmm. um, the court then grappled with the effect of that last will that mm -hmm. said nothing to my daughter. Mm -hmm. That was to, it was a valid change. It, mm -hmm. it meant that the 
residue clause was no longer there, mm -hmm. but it left the problem of a residue clause or a residue that wasn't disposed of exactly. by any oil. Exactly. So the court then looked to see what would happen with, with, to that residue. Mm -hmm. um, it was argued that uh, uh, it would pass on an intestacy. The daughter argued it passed on mm -hmm. an intestacy and would pass to her. Therefore, um, the family members said, no, that was an un yeah. unfair and improper uh, outcome because the deceased specifically intended that nothing right. would go to Petra. Right. The courts said, you know, quite frankly, that the intent at that point is of no importance. Yeah, yeah. Like if exactly. it passes on an intestacy, it passes on an intestacy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and you know, what you say does, doesn't necessarily uh, mm -hmm. change that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you, you can make a will and, and you have that right to distribute it the way that you want. But if you don't go far enough and you don't deal with all of your estate or all of the residue, then that's where the intestacy provisions have to step in. Mm -hmm. And then it's it's not up to you anymore. So even though the deceased had an intent that nothing would go to his daughter because mm -hmm. that intent wasn't properly uh, resulting in the intestacy, yeah. it didn't change the, what would happen with the situation yeah. so on the yeah. intestacy. The outcome is kind of funny because... It, it, the, it, what happened was exactly what he didn't want to happen. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's the unfortunate part yeah. of that. And I think that's the maybe one of the takeaways is... Mm -hmm. Be very careful when you're doing your estate planning. Um, yeah. If you're going to do it yourself, make sure you know, know what you're doing. Right. Mm -hmm. And the, the best advice would be to go to a lawyer who mm -hmm. will hopefully prepare a proper and valid will that will give full effect to your intentions. Yeah, exactly. And then as far as the alterations too, um, I mean, it, it's interesting that the Succession Law Reform Act has, uh, you know, the provisions for to make a holograph will more right. informally, and then also provisions to make alterations to a, a holograph will on a less formal basis as well. Right. So it is simpler to do it that way, but if you don't know how to do it, then you can still end up um, in this situation where your know, right. alterations have no effect. The formalities really can trip you up. Mm -hmm. um, there was an article recently published by uh, Professor Oosterhoff that dealt with this, and mm -hmm. one of the arguments he said is that the last will may have republished the prior wills and codicils, mm -hmm. um, and the effect of that might have been to validate the changes to the specific request right. to the family members. Mm -hmm. um, that would still mean that the residue would pass on an intestacy mm -hmm. to the daughter, but the residue would have been smaller right. by that point. Right. So that's something that wasn't wasn't considered by the court, so it doesn't look like that was argued, but mm -hmm. that's uh, an interesting uh, comment or perspective. Yeah. yeah, it seems like there's a lot of ways that this could have been interpreted and a lot of ways it could have turned out. Right, right. So I think that um, is a, an important case to uh, to review and mm -hmm. so just to keep in mind. And uh, maybe it's a, like a scary story we can yeah. tell our clients <laughs> or tell others that you know you must be, be know what you're doing, be very careful yeah. what you're doing. And uh, uh, the, the the fact that he made this change, nothing to my daughter, didn't have that effect. Yeah, ended up. Nothing. I think you have to be careful with respect to making uh, negative bequests or saying that somebody doesn't get something because that may invalidate yeah. a gift and they yeah. may get it uh, under the Succession Law Reform Act. Exactly. Under the yeah, anyway. on its own, it doesn't uh, it doesn't carry any weight beyond revoking mm -hmm. something, as in this case. Okay, we'll we'll put uh, a link up to that case on our website, and we want to thank you for listening. And until next time, I'm Paul Trudell, and I'm Rebecca Rose. And if you want to send us an email or with any questions or comments or suggestions, please email us at webmaster at or leave us a comment on our blog page. Thank you.